Hey, welcome to The Screenwriting Life. I'm Meg LaFauve. And I'm Lorianne McKenna. We are professional screenwriters. We've worked together as a team and separately. We've worked on studio and indie films, live action and animation, from my work on Inside Out and Captain Marvel. To my work in Pixar's story department on Up, Brave, and Inside Out. We are here to share our insights on the craft of screenwriting and also the life. How to not only survive the ups and downs, but thrive. We want to help you become the best screenwriter you can be and to reassure you that you are not alone on this journey. Hey guys, welcome back to today's show. We're so glad you could join us. Yeah, welcome. We're really excited about the show today. We're going to talk about creating a character with agency. And uh, before we get to that topic, we're going to talk about our week and what we like to call adventures in screenwriting. And I'm realizing as I talk, I left the door open behind me. Can you hear the giant plane going overhead? No, yes, is it okay? Whatever. No, um, no. <clears throat> hey, it's, uh, it's Corona, Corona podcast time. Um, okay, <laughs> Lorian, how was your week? Uh, my week was good, I think. It's always interesting to get to the end of the week on the show and then looking back to figure out what I actually accomplished. Um, so this week I worked on a couple of pitches. I have a feature that I am doing a polish on. Um, I'm trying to cut 10 pages out of it, maybe more because it's too long and um, I've had some distance from it. So I feel like I can go in now and really look at the character arcs and what do I need to cut because I'm not so emotionally in it as I was when I was writing it um, a couple months ago. So, um, and then, uh, and doing a lot of parenting uh, and not cleaning the house. Uh, I'm sort of on strike a little bit. Uh, my husband always does the dishes, which is amazing, but I am not mopping the floor, which is not amazing. But um, what I'm really working on this week is trying to establish a morning routine so that I, I feel like I can be more available for my family and also like more productive. Something about wearing hard pants, like taking a shower and putting like jeans on or real pants makes me feel like, makes me feel better, more empowered to like actually sit down and do my stuff. And then I'm also working on, um, I have a lot, I've talked about this before. I have a lot of negative self-talk in my head, just a constant chatter of you're not doing enough. It's not good enough. And so I'm trying to um, wrestle with when I get to the end of the day and I look back at what I've done, if it's been like a really high distraction day and I haven't gotten to really do a lot to not beat myself up about it, like awesome. to, to focus on what I actually did that was positive and not focus so much on productivity because I'm very results driven and very like how much did I get done how many pages did I write how many emails did I get through and so I'm trying to separate myself a little bit from that because the the just the nonsense of my head is overwhelming and I I can't keep doing that to myself especially because I'm not going out you know to a studio or meeting with people and getting sort of different levels of feedback Right. right. We are not getting that. And, um, and so it's, I'm working on that. It's hard. It's hard. Well, but it, is it's hard. it is hard. Cause it's kind of like definitions of productivity and definitions of success. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sometimes the day that you don't feel like you got a lot done. In fact, you did maybe the most important piece that needed that space. So you right. never know, right. You can never tell what is productive and what isn't, but I I'm right there with you. Um, I'm trying to run, which I mean, ha ha ha. Meaning, I. It's so funny. I do these, this, this, this exercise routine, and inside she's like, "Now let's take it up to eighty percent." And I'm literally like, <laughs> <laughs> "I mean, I am not a runner, but I'm trying." And uh, for you. I keep trying over and over, and then I quit. And then, like four months later, I try again, and then I quit. And like four months later, I try again. And yesterday, I finally, for the very first time in my whole life, had a blip of a runner's high where I just so great. the flow and I realized oh it, it is like writing like if you keep starting and quitting you're never really getting into the deep flow because you're never building enough craft and enough you know any craft or yeah. art takes time to get into your brain and to, and it takes yeah. a lot of work. It takes a lot of repetitive writing, writing, writing for it to click over into levels. And I, and I was running thinking, I mean, by the way, I haven't gotten there again, but um, I did. So I think writing Good can for you. Like that, like, you know, be, so make, you know, if, try to stay in, even if you're just doing a little bit, if you beat yeah. yourself up about productivity and then you quit, 
you have to think you're, you've stopped the stream, right? You've now you got to probably a lot of times you got to go back to the beginning of the stream and keep going. So yeah. um, the other fun thing that happened is our web series break room, which, you know, which is on YouTube. I love it. Um, we got more Big hits. Than a, we got more hits than a lifetime movie. Nice. Oh, I think it's pretty awesome. Looks so, very exciting. hasn't gone, please go to Break Room USA on YouTube. It's super fun. We'll put a link on the fun. Facebook page. And um, the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of my week was um, I've got a show in development for television, and I'm working with a partner, partner Jonathan. And you know, this week was literally just what we called chunking it out. We had to pitch our. Um, new revised version of the outline to try to get to go to draft and it was literally just kind of chunking it out and that helps my brain in terms of that productivity just to go to what you were talking about like did I get a chunk today did I just get a chunk a teeny chunk a big chunk it doesn't matter I'm just chunking it out as I can and in that chunking out we realized that it's a it's 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 a lead show but with a very strong main relationship and in in doing the revisions, a, revision, a note that seemed very easy had the result of us having to go back and look at that main relationship and that supporting character and us realizing we have two archetypes in him and we're cheating like mm. mad and how we have to pick an, an, an archetype. And that mm. maybe has to be a conversation with producers and even the studio because what archetype did they have in their head? Right. So we had and they were kind of very opposing archetypes. So when we wanted him to be stoic and an authority, he was and when we wanted him to be playful and kind of mercenary, he was. And I'm not saying you can't have both those things, but that's pretty tricky because they are different archetypes. So that was illuminating. Right. And slightly, you know, I was like, oh, my God. But what was great about it is I wanted to share with you the solutions to that problem, which speak to our topic today, because. I was like, okay, what archetype is he? Uh, what are the freaking archetypes? Oh my God. And so we, we picked two and then we went and I went through <clears throat> IMDb. Yeah, you know, I did a search on IMDb for actors in a certain age category and started pulling out actors, movie stars, really, not for casting, but for my brain to say, okay, he often plays this archetype and he often plays that archetype. And I divide, and I had a list, right, of okay, this archetype is Russell Crowe, Jeff Bridges, John Wayne, blah, blah, blah. This archetype is young Brad Pitt, young Harrison Ford, Woody Harrelson, right? Mm. It just helped my brain. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, this part isn't good enough in either archetype because I can't imagine this level of actor mm. in these scenes because he's not doing enough. Mm. He's so reactive to the other character that these actors wouldn't take the part. And so it was this kind of like, oh, oh, oh. And I was like, hold it, hold it. We got to stop, time out. Because we have to go back and look at this part. We have to pick the archetype. We have to get them active. And it has to be a part that we could get this level of actor. I'm not saying they'd ever do it, but you know what I mean? Like it's that good. So it was really uh, illuminating for me. And, and it was just something to share an exercise that we did and that we can talk about more when we get to the agency part of the show. Mm -hmm. I love that, that. That's actually really cool. Yeah, I do that. I, I troll IMDB looking for actors and I think it's always really fun to imagine them. But I think that's such an interesting idea. What, is this good enough for Woody Harrelson to take on? Like, would he sink his teeth into this role, right? So is yeah, it like juicy talking, enough for him? I was talking yeah. to Jonathan and I was like, in this scene right here, can you imagine Russell Crowe doing that? No, never in a million years would he just follow this girl. Blah, blah, blah. I, I was like, no, he would do this. He would do that. He would do that. Again, again, it doesn't have to be Russell Crowe, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it didn't have any agency. There was nothing for that actor to do. Um, so suddenly I was like, oh, let's go back <laughs> to the engine. <laughs> thing. Um, but it's good because good, now to do an outline. Let's do it right now. Yeah. It's a great thing. Yeah, really better do. than in script. Yeah, it's going to happen in script anyways, where you got in there and you were like, uh, muck, muck, <laughs> muck, right? Um, all right, so uh, we're going to get onto our topic now, which does connect to that. Um, but before we do, Jeff is going to read a couple of pod reviews because Lauren and I do not like to talk about <laughs> ourselves, as you know. Uh, but thanks, you guys, for... Um, emailing us we love your questions uh i've gone you know we've gone through all the questions and um got a whole group to, to talk about on the show and um 
but an Apple podcast, it really helps us if you can go to and review us. It just helps us keep the show going. Yeah, we continue to yep. just get this flood of incredible feedback from you guys. And we're just um, so honored to have such a thoughtful, well-written community joining the show. It's really, really fun. So continue to write in. Um, and I do want to make a quick movie recommendation. Meg, I'm hoping you saw Britney Runs a Marathon last year. Did you I catch did that movie? I did see it. I'm I just, as you uh, oh. work on your running. Oh, I don't think that image has come into my mind many a time. <laughs> if he, uh, listen, that, that actress did it. Like, she did it. Right? Gosh, Forget about so the movie. Good. That actress did it. So let's go. I can Jillian Bell, it's such a wonderful film and a uh, very well written movie too. Great script if any of you yeah. guys need to catch something. Okay, I'm first going to start with Tom Moore, who you sent me a review, um, a little email from him, Meg. He is the, a director at Cartoon Saloon, where you've done a little bit of work. Um, he said, what a gift your podcast is. I'm drawing the comic of Wolf Walkers and listening to it all day. So honest and informative. On behalf of people like me everywhere, thank you. Hope you guys are keeping safe in these strange times. So Tom, thanks so much. We're honored to have some industry insiders listening to the show as well. Um, all right, a couple of Apple podcast reviews. They just keep rolling in and I wish we had time on the show to read all of them. I want you guys to know we do read all of them in our own time, especially when we need a little uh, positive feedback, right? Uh, but I'm just gonna read a yeah. couple on the show today. Um, this first one comes from Teresa Tuin and she says, this is the best storytelling resource out there. I've tried to read a number of screenwriting and story how-to books, and nothing has even come close to being as helpful as this podcast. Megan and Lorian do an excellent job of explaining the fundamentals of writing in an emotionally resident, uh, emotionally resonant, character-driven story in an easy-to-understand way that is helpful for all kinds of writers, not just screenwriters. I find their podcast entertaining, and it's filled with valuable pearls that I listen to each podcast twice just to take notes the second time. Thanks to everyone on the team for helping us be creative and inspired during this challenging time. Teresa, what a lovely review. Thank you so much. I will also read Thank Shelly's you. first review uh, written a couple days ago. She says, this podcast is full of gold for anyone writing for a career or for a hobby. It has life advice too. I've never written a review for a podcast or even Amazon or anything. And here I am telling you that this is worth your time with five exclamation points. So oh, nice. Shelly, Ooh. thanks so much. And um, Thank you. you. Know, it's really, it's our pleasure. It's uh, just as much, it's just as wonderful for us as it is for you guys. So thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in. Thank you guys. Yes, thank you. Lovely. Thanks, it really means a um, lot to us. Before we get into the topic, I wanna go back to what you were saying, Meg, about pushing through. And I also do an exercise thing. And the coach said something really interesting to me this morning while I was dying on my bike. Um, it was really hard. She was like, this is where change happens. You wanna quit your your muscles are dying you're out of breath and if you push through it's where change happens and i thought that was so i mean i think she said that a whole bunch of times you know but it really resonated today because i pushed through right and i think so framing it that way too like this is where you start your muscle memory starts to kick in and you can sort of inch forward and changing yes, your habits amazing. and your approach that's amazing because yeah. it is true both for exercise and writing right because you know, an exercise yeah. right when I have every excuse in the book has come up, been thrown into my mind of why I need to stop, which is I'm going to throw up, I'm having a heart attack, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. If I can push through, that's when that high happened. And I got this whole second wind. Well, okay, less than a block, but it was something, right? But yeah, that's what the thing is. But it's the same for writing, right? When you literally want to quit, you don't want to write today, your, your critic is up really high. You just have to push through. When you don't know what to write, write, I don't know what to write. Write the bad right. version. Write anything because it's about the flow of the brain writing. That's all you have to do. Just sit down and write something. So it really does right. work. And you can look back eventually at your work and see the change, but you can't see it sometimes in the moment that you're there. Right. Writing's a little easier because I can run further and know I ran half a block. But writing, you don't know. But you will eventually when you look back and you can see. And there's certain things you're just going to have to learn every time you start a new script. Sorry, but yeah. that's how it goes. Yeah. Um, so right. we so had a question that. that we wanted to make our topic. It's from Joni B. She says, hello from the Midwest. Yay, Midwest. I'm a Midwestern girl. Uh, loving your show so much. Thank you. Uh, can you discuss agency in story and characters? Uh, maybe any tips to consider agency in a two-hander? Uh, when we're tracking two sets of wants and goals and point of views um, as we go. So um, 
you know, really this is active versus reactive characters, right? Like uh, my friend Sheila mm -hmm. always calls it the first rookie mistake. But I have to say, even I know pro writers who our first drafts are reactive main characters. It's a weird brain thing. You just write them reactive at first because you think your life is happening to you versus you mm -hmm. creating your life. Um, so you just got to get past that draft. I just put it into the barf draft, look back. Like I said, I just wrote this thing for a, 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 a network and I wrote a reactive main character. So it's just part of something that can happen. Um, I had a little, I did a little exercise on agency. I didn't know, Lauren, if you want to jump in and talk about uh, what you want to say, and then I can do the little exercise or I don't know, what, how do you want to do it? I think uh, I, for me, it's about like, what is agency? Right. What does that actually mean when we talk about that? And can you have a character who is discovering their agency in a story and still have agency? Right. Um, and so how you do that, like how you make sure that their decisions still drive the plot, but that they're still finding their whatever, their voice, their power, their decision making abilities as a character in the story. And I think that's really tricky. So um, what is agency? All right. right. What does that mean? <laughs> so I went, I, I had a friend who's more of a mentor, really, Madeline, and she used to do this exercise where she would say, go to the dictionary. And it, you're like, what? Go to the dictionary. But it's actually kind of amazing. Because if you go to the dictionary, you look up the word agency, it says action or intervention to produce a particular effect. So the, the synonyms, which are so awesome for agency, are action, effect, influence, force, Power, think of your character. Do they have influence? Do they have force? Do they have power of any kind? They must, they're a living human breathing person. They're not, you know, they're not a child. And if they are, we can talk about that. Technique, do they have a technique? Involvement, mediation, imposition, are they imposing, enterprising, influential, committed, devoted? It's a great word. What are they devoted to? Uh, vital, determined, it can go all the way to zealous militant, radical, now we're getting to the other side, right, of agency, right? Mm -hmm. um, all of those words are such good words to think about in terms of your character, and they're, they, they're creating, they're making them active and powerful. The opposite is indifference and passive, right? So I think in terms of your question, Lorian, there's a difference between I don't know my own agency and being indifferent, Right. And being a victim to your life. I'm not saying they can't be victims, but what we're interested in is their response to victimhood. It might be passive aggressive because they don't know their own agency. They can't do it directly. But what, that's what I'm, I'm tuning into your story for is to hear how they deal with feeling overwhelmed or they have no agency. That's what's interesting because um, they still have to create the plot with their choices. They just do. That's right. Um, and I think want is such is the main driver of agency and an active character. You, if you if want is a hard word for you because we talked about this, I think that women often have a hard time with want because we've been enculturated to not want. We've been enculturated to help and to figure out what everybody else wants, but not necessarily ourselves. That's work you need to do on yourself, I think, um, through your characters. You can think of it this way: What do they believe in? Right. If you can't think of a want because it like fries your brain, what do they believe in? What do, what are they? Do they believe like against? Right. Like what are they against? Mm -hmm. That starts to give you some active drive. Right. Um, and if you know, I think two great things to look at if you have a character who the purpose of the character is to disconnect. Right. Look at the movie Blue. Um, Kieslowski's, uh, he did the three colors, blue. She is actively trying to, to leave life. She is actively trying to be inactive. It's beautiful, right? Watch how active she is in trying to feel nothing. She's trying to have no agency. That is what her goal is. And she's so active in how she does it. Hmm. And then I was just watching right. Normal People and the intro oh of that God. character is a beautiful example of somebody who, in terms of circumstance, is has no agency, but her introduction is active. Her introduction immediately shows her character. It shows her, what she believes. It shows so many things in terms of, and it's just a moment, but it just lands it, bang. 
that doesn't, she is struggling with her agency through those, ep those episodes, but she is trying to find it. It's mm -hmm. not an inactive, indifferent, you could have written that character and I've seen that character written where they're the bullied character and they're just reacting to everything. And there, you know, I just wanna say there's a big difference between attaching to a character emotionally and feeling pity for them. Hmm. You don't want pity. That's not hmm. attachment. That's, I feel pity, to feel pity, I'm, I'm a separate from the character. I attach to the character because even in all of this overwhelm and bullying, there is a spark. There is a really specific response to it. Even if it's passive aggressive, even whatever, there is a response. And that's why I'm attaching to the character because of that response. So um, some exercises that, and then I'll get to the dual protagonist. I think we have time is, um, mm -hmm. You know, make your character, just as a writing exercise, desperately want something, something, right? If it can't be the larger plot goal, which it really does need to be, but you just need to exercise that in your brain, write a few scenes where they actually desperately want something and attach me to that want and watch that agency drive into the script. Because when you desperately want something, you figure out how to become active. You figure out your agency, right? I mean, we've seen movies like, you know, it, it can be the most extreme situation of no agency and those characters figure out the something, even the smallest thing, right? The other thing you can do is chart your main character. So in each uh, scene, right? Uh, right on the left-hand column, the scene action, and then chart them and watch, are they taking action? Uh, just really look at it in black and white in a chart. And if I would say for when you have two, do the same thing. Do one for, let's say him and her, because it's easier. One for her, one for him. How are they being active? And how are they, are their actions affecting each other and pushing each other into choices? And that's what I realized with our script is by making him not have as much agency. It's interesting because the one note we got was we want more relationship in here. In this, well, why did we get that note? So I could have just gone in and plunked in a bunch of relationship, but really there was a deeper problem under the note, which is he doesn't have as much agency. He does, he isn't active. So he's not forcing the relationship to expose itself. You know what I mean? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not forging a relationship because he's he just keeps responding to her instead of pushing her so that then she can push back and you can actually start to get a relate, a real relationship. Um, so it was really illuminating to me I, at the time I was like, Oh, Jonathan, I can't wait to talk about this on the podcast to share it with everyone. Um, <laughs> you know, the other thing you can do, um, oh, and when you're charting, really look at the climax of the movie, because here's what I will say. If your main character isn't taking the action, the agency in the climax, they're not the main character. Mm. Whoever is doing it is the main character. And really for female characters, not so much anymore, but well, boy, when I, was in, when I was a producer in the business, it was a constant problem that she would be active and then at the climax, a man would walk in and do the climactic action. And it would be throw that out because that is not, then she's not the main character, right? She doesn't need to be saved right now, right? So uh, like I, I had this great female boxer come in and they were gonna write a movie about her and she was so powerful just sitting at the table she was so powerful and the end of the pitch was that her 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 coach stops the fight because he doesn't want her to get hurt and I just looked at her ah, and I was ah, like ah. you realize they just castrated you right like I don't know how else to say it like and she was like yeah. what and I was like yikes I mean it was amazing <laughs> Um, another exercise you can do is what I did. Imagine an actor in the role. Imagine who are the five actors. Again, this is imagination. This is like we're looking for archetypes, right? Who are the five movie star actors that would be great in the role? And then think about who, could they play it? Have you got enough action for them? Go watch a few of their movies. Track them like we talked about, right, on the structure points. Track a few of those actors and watch how active they are. Watch how they appear to be inactive, but really they're active, right? Watch how they respond to things, right? Do they, you know, it's, you'll, it just, it'll just be mind blowing in terms of the illumination of agency by having actual examples that fit to your script. 
Um, right. So, you know, how do they, and then, you know, the last thing I would say is, you know, it's their drive. Their agency is their drive. Um, like I said, want, what are they manifesting in the script? And when you've got two, if it's a true two-hander, they every structure point, they are each changing and turning because they each have their own introduction. They each have the, an inciting incident. They each have an end of act one, hopefully now together. They each plan and goal hopefully is now the same, even though they may be butting heads or not, it depends, right? Midpoint, they're both shifting. They're both having an end of act two. It may not be at the same time, right? So they have to have their own movie inside the movie. And that's, oh, that's another thing I did for our TV show. I was like, you know what, Jonathan? I think as a writing exercise, we have to say this episode from his point of view. It's his, it's not, it's not her show. It's his show. What is, what happens? Which is what's going to be my homework over the weekend. Because I, I need to get into him deeper. And I realized how much I don't know him in terms of enough of his past. And so um, those are all some stuff you can do. Um, and if you really super, super duper have trouble with agency, um, you might need to look at that in yourself and what you're afraid of manifesting that it may actually trigger, go all the way back to you and that you are actually afraid of manifesting in the world. And you got to really look at that because I understand that part of your brain thinks you'll die if you manifest, but of course that's not true. So th this is the fight. This is the lava part of it. Right. Right. Cause I there's think this is yeah. part of why, oh, sorry. This is part of why women writers, when they write female characters often can't give their female characters agency because We've been, like you said, enculturated to stand down, be quiet, don't threaten, or you'll die. Right. Right. So when you're writing, it's often hard to put your character in situations where you think she's going to die if she stands up, if she, you know, tries to manifest agency. Um, one of the things I'm doing in my the polish is I'm looking at every single scene to see that it has to happen in order to get to the next scene. That, that my character is making a decision that drives me to the next scene. And mm -hmm. because it could just be, I'm just watching her do things as we move through three scenes. Like, but if I can take us, yeah. yeah, if I can take a scene out and it, it didn't, it just like, and then it will just weigh the script down because then we're just, you know, we're just watching nothing, you know, nothing's happening. I mean, she's talking crap and moving shit around, but she's not actually driving us to the next scene. So that's the thing. And that's really hard. It's going to be hard because I'm going to have to tear apart some stuff. I really love I some know. moments. And so, but it's like one of the checks I have to do now is do I need every single scene? If I took it out, would the plot be the same? No, it's so important. I mean, do that chart, I, you know, cause you'll see, is she mm -hmm. moving scene to scene? And I'm telling you, actors know, they know. And they don't want to repeat the same thing in the next scene. They already did it. What's next? What's evolving? What is the new yeah. thing you're showing about me? How are you testing me more so that I have to like know myself better? Because I didn't even know I was going to do that, right? Like that you have for sure that in terms of if you have a long script, that's the very first thing to do. And I also wanted to pick yeah. up on something you said in terms of um, women in want. Um, you know, I also think there's another layer to it and we might get a lot of letters, which is the old fashioned word way of saying. Um, I do think that women have been taught that their power is victimization. And it's a seductive power because it means you don't have to actually be responsible and you don't actually have to show yourself. And it's tricky. Right. Because, again, I'm not saying you can't have victims in your script. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where does the power base of the character come from? And if it is the victimization only. I think you have a problem because it's just inherently not creating a layered character with agency. Right. I want, again, it's the response to the victimization that I'm interested in. And I want a different power base. That's just, you know, this is just my opinion. You can all write in and disagree. Um, I want to see what is the response and what's the power base towards that victimization, not the victimization is the power base. So, so let's talk about an example, right? So someone, uh, a, a character who's been abandoned, right? right? Abandoned by her parents. She grows up, she keeps recreating these relationships where she's abandoned, right? right? And so then that is her main 
her main emotional and psychological driving force is fear of abandonment, right? So where does the, the victim power sit and how do you how do you write away from that, right? So that everything she does is driven by that abandonment. Is well, that what again, you're talking again, about? Yeah, are you doing a tragedy? Uh, if it, a tragedy is, she will start to evolve out of the abandonment and then at the last moment, go back and choose the victim power and g- get herself abandoned again. And we'll be like, oh my God, right. the tragedy is she's just repeating this pattern over and over, right? Um, right. So in terms of that, I would say, what I want to see is the inciting incident is how is she going to evolve? What is your perspective on human beings evolving out of abandonment? And what are the steps to that? What are the steps to taking claim of your own life? If it's just a whole second act of her being abandoned over and over, number one, it flatlines as a plot. Yeah. She's not evolving. Again, unless your point is she keeps setting herself up to abandon and this is a tragedy, that's a different thing. If it is about an right. evolutionary transformative character, then my brain immediately goes to, what do I know about abandonment? And I would go talk to my friend who's a child psychiatrist, or there's tons of stuff online, and there's probably steps that people use to move a person from who have a, an addiction to abandonment, an addiction to the victimization, to move them into their own power base right? But that's what you're going to start doing. And I would also say, probably even in that abandonment, she has some interesting, wonderful character traits to how she deals with it, right? It could be like, I don't fucking care. Fuck you. All right. Like, that's great. It It's it's not the deeper interior stuff, because we know she will find out she really does care. But we kind of admire the moxie of like, fuck, you know, I don't care. Like, yeah. what do I admire even in that uh, that abandoned person, right? And it could just be how they handle the stress of abandonment, right? Like, you know, mm-hmm. you could do the guy who sits in his room and types on his computer and um, and, 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 and never lets go. But I've seen that scene like a million times. So what's a more interesting way to show a character who can't handle social interaction, right? Like, put him out in the world, right? How does he maneuver... Right. How is it kind of like it? How is it? How do you admire the way he maneuvers, not socially interacting with anybody? Right. Right. That's I just imagined fun. a scene in a coffee shop. How he's navigating a coffee shop without having to actually interact with anyone. Right. And like, suddenly you love him. Yeah. Versus the victim yeah. sitting at home. Boo hoo! Poor me. I can't socially interact. Put them into action. Put. They have some agency. They have to have some want. They want the apple pie at the coffee shop. So it's going right. to force them out and then we have the the, the love and, and maybe they're socially active because of abandonment, right? So these things are to layer, right? But we love watching him and how he gets the apple pie without actually talking to somebody. And then he meets a girl who will not let him do it, right? <laughs> she will not go for this game he's playing and it's going to incite an incident. Boom. How does he respond to that? Is he going to take a little step forward? Oh my God. Oh my God. He's actually going to you know, email her or whatever, right? Right. But the but the version where that character is sitting in their victim power, it's it's them sort of rolling around in it, right? Like I'm gonna stay home. I'm going they're to not I'm active. just not gonna go. Oh, they're not active, right? So that's what you're saying. And I'm about. feeling sorry for him in the scene of the diner versus, oh my God, he's so smart and clever in the way he did it, or he, something that I admire about him, even as mm-hmm. I feel bad for him, right? That's fine. But that he's a human, he's a full human. He is not just his victimization. Maybe think of it that way. He isn't just yeah. his victimization, which quite is quite condescending, I have to say, to your character, mm-hmm. right? That you think that he, that, that character is only their victimization. That's super, like, like come on. Like so when people won't beat up their characters in act two, I think that's super condescending because you're basically yeah. saying they can't handle it. Well, maybe right. you can't handle it, but they can because they're a, they're a hero in a in a movie. So the very act of being a hero is you got to go get beat up and learn your capability. You know, often the opposite of that, you know, fear is capability. So maybe act two is literally just learning capability. So eventually abandonment doesn't have the impact that it used to have. And honestly, I think at the bottom of abandonment, just to use that as an example of if you really start going into what is abandonment, what do I think about it? What's my experience with it? And get into the lava. Often what you find is that the person who abandons you first is you. And there comes an end of act two. 
there comes a real, because the problem with the victimization power is your end of act two is there, they did it. Well, I already know that. That's the whole movie. I want to know about the character's confrontation with themselves. Mm. And often, it doesn't all have to be, but I'm just using this as an example. Often, when you really get into abandonment, what can be at the bottom there is the person who's abandoning you and internally is you. You are not standing by you. You are the first one out, right? You are the one not willing to run through that last hurdle where you think you're going to puke or sit down. Who's really abandoning somebody? And there's power in that. That's not about beating you up. The end of act two is there's power in that, which is don't do like you have agency. You you've learned don't do it all, again. Don't do it. Yeah. You, you've learned all the capability through act two of how not really, if you go back and look at what the character was learning was how not to abandon themselves, that risk is okay, that that is life, that is evolution, right? That joy is okay because joy is it, it, joy is joy is joy is life, right? That happiness is okay, or whatever it is you're afraid of, right? So, meaning there's a lot in ab in abandonment, right? And it's like, what is your thing within abandonment? Like when we talk about theme, abandonment is the category, right? What right. about abandonment are you actually dealing with? And you get into it, and you find out by giving your character agency. If you don't know, that's fine. Most of us don't know what we're writing about, but forcing them into action, they start to tell you. Does that make mm. sense? Even if in writing exercises, it's, they start to tell you who they are by how they're responding to things. And I, that's my favorite part of writing, when I don't know what the hell they're, they're doing, right? Because it's some deeper part of me taking over and they're showing me who they are, right? Like I really think this character got pretty pissed at me at his agency. So that what, I think he was just waiting for me to look. And I suddenly was like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Sorry, I left you over there. Um, so uh, I, don't, I just kind of went on the tear there. Sorry, I got passionate. No, that's great. It's great. I um, everyone with abandonment issues who's listening is going to be like, oh, <laughs> talking to me. I mean, I don't know why I brought that issue up per se. You know, as an se. example. <laughs> but um, I mean, I I have a my feature is about a young girl who was abandoned, and at the end when she has her big you know act three moment, I was having such a hard time letting her like be vulnerable and emotional and like and I kept I've rewritten that scene so many times and because it's so painful that like I have to imagine myself in that position having gone through this and like I have to put in that I have to get inside her and it's it's hard but you know I'll be working on that later today again but um no, good. you gotta stay in the lava making, it's okay it, you know because I know it's, it's not it's not just her plot movement. It's not just her doing what she does. It's her, it's her, you know, choosing herself. Like what mm -hmm. you're saying, like, I'm not going to abandon myself in this moment. And uh, it's, it's hard. I just, I'm here to say it's hard to everyone who's working on this. It stuff. is hard, It is hard, but you there's know, huge you know. rewards because the evolution is also happening to you. Right. So um, can I, I quickly I, ask, yeah, go ahead. I just, one of the challenges I often find and is like, when you have, when you imbue your characters with agency, that's what drives the story, but how do you sustain act two when you're creating these really active characters who are pursuing their wants, but still not achieving their wants, if that makes sense. Like they need to be learning lessons and growing through act two as they're active, but you also need to uh, like maintain a, you know, maintain a character growth that's not too rapid. I don't know if that question is making sense or not. No, you, they can't get to the end of act two realization before end of act two. But remember, you've in act one convinced me that what they believe is true. Mm. So we're waking up with them. So if you look at Nemo, you have to have that little scene at the beginning where all of his kids die and his wife dies because he believes that if off the reef is dangerous and that he can't handle it. So act two is in showing him examples of it is dangerous, but you can handle it. And there's also beauty out here. There's turtles. Like, to get somebody to change, to take them through the myriad of things they have to see and experience and more importantly, do, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're challenging their brain to say, is that true? Well, look at that. Look at this. You did this. And a relationship is forming in which there's another voice, usually without consciousness, understands this, th this thematic that they're going to come to, right? Mm. Dory says, if you never, if nothing ever happens to your son, then nothing ever happens to him. Mm -hmm. 
That makes sense. Right? So it's right. So you're you're and what I think is right before the end of Act Two, they are learning, they are growing. Joy is understanding that sadness is more important. She is starting to see all these different aspects of sadness, where sadness is able to move them forward when Joy couldn't. She is starting to bond with her and have intimate moments with her emotionally and see her in a different way. And then right before the end of Act Two, we give Joy an impossible test, and she reverts all the way back to Act One. She reverts all the way back to, you're yeah. fucking dangerous, get out of here, which is why they have to go down to the bottom. You have to strip them of everything. So right? you're essentially like pushing your character's agency gradually throughout act two until they face a task or a trial that at that moment, they don't have enough agency for in a way. Well, I don't think you're pushing them and increasing their agency. They can have tremendous agency. Mm -hmm. It's their interior transformation that you're pushing. Yeah, okay. Right, it's the interior evolution of who of of the of, of what this is about what is your movie about it's that theme that arc is what you're evolving but they can have inc incredible agency they can be a superhero right mm -hmm. i mean how much that, more agency could you get decision yeah that decision in the end of act two when they go the other direction that's them you know exerting their agency yeah. they make a choice i'm not doing that i'm doing that and it's a very active choice right mm -hmm. joy's yeah. kicking her out of the two right so it's not that you're increasing their agency. You can give them as much agency or as little as you want, depending on the character, um, but not to, not nothing, right? Right. Um, but it's the uh, interior evolution that you're actually tracking. Like I would literally have a column where I'm tracking their, that emotional thematic and what they're learning in each sequence. So I understand, well, she learned that about sadness here and she learned that about sadness there. Here is her, you know, what is happening in that, uh, that 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 thematic moving, um, that's really what's evolving there. Totally cool. Thank you. I hope I didn't derail the conversation. Just no, not at all. It's Super all helpful. it's all the same. It's all wrapped up together. Um, yes. Do we have time for our question of the week? I think no? a quickie. I think we've got four minutes. So yes. Okay. Well, Ooh, we're gonna okay. do this quick. This is um, a question from Stephanie who asked about giving notes. That she's a producer giving notes to a writer director who uh, finds that he's not taking them and that he's avoiding her questions and having trouble getting to the core. And she feels that at this point, she's done the work for him. Um, and I, you know, here's the quick uh, 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 version of this because we only have four minutes. Uh, a producer and, and writer, especially director's relationship is all based on trust. It is all based on them trusting you with their emotional heart with their softest, most vulnerable piece of themselves. You can't ask somebody to get to the emotional core of a movie in an intellectual way. D totally doesn't work brain-wise, doesn't work, right? It's, it's a deeper quest that you're on. It's not notes. It is right. forging a relationship with questions and curiosity, right? Of, you know, take walks, and when finally this director's trusting you that you're not trying to pin him down, fuck him over, uh, make his movie what you want versus what he wants. I mean, there's a thousand reasons to not trust, right? When you're the creative, um, spend the day talking about his childhood, talking about his brothers and sisters, talking about where he came from, talk about the day that he was the most ashamed, the day he was the saddest, the day he was the happiest, you know, pick the core, core emotions and what were those days for him, right? And really dig in them to, with true curiosity, right? Um, and it isn't usually something that can happen over a table by email. It, it's take a social distancing walk um, right. because it's a, it's it also, lava, you're, you're asking this person yeah. to walk into lava. They're lava. And you have to, you have to expose yourself too. And sometimes you have to be the one who says, here's this truth about me. Here's where I was my most ashamed. You have to sort of put something on the table too so that they know that they can meet you there, that you're not just you know, interviewing them or trying to psychoanalyze them. This is a partnership and that you both have to be vulnerable in order to find that common space where you can dig at what is actually going on in the project. Yeah, I was working with, as a, as a mentor producer, I don't know even what to call me with a friend who was doing a script about a child with special needs and um, trying to get him to go deeper. And finally I was like, okay, well, let me, I'm gonna talk about my son with special needs. And I told him about one of the most vulnerable, upsetting days I had, which is my son who was like 12 at the time, 
having an accident in his pants in the middle of Target and how uh, oh, emotional it was and how people looking at me and I got to get him into the bathroom but now he's old enough that women are upset that he's coming in and the judgment and he's starting to cry and now it's fully going into a meltdown and I literally can feel in my like body like oh my god I just wish he was normal and then I hate myself for saying it and I just really went deeply vulnerably into my relationship with my son which I just did with all of you and um Thank He's looking you. at me with these big eyes, and he says, "So you want me to walk into lava, basically? You want me? So you want me to stick my head in lava?" And I was like, "No, your whole body." <laughs> That's what you're asking your writer director to do. It's super vulnerable. Why should he trust you? And here's the other thing I hear in your note to be very careful of: don't be a shadow artist. This is his. This is his lava. You are probably relating to the lava. You've been tuned into it, which is beautiful, but you can't write through him. You, if you're afraid to stand in the light and be visible in the lava and put your personal lava out there, that's what the artist is doing, right? And I know this because I was a shadow artist. It's not healthy for you or him or the project. You have to really have a really, and if you may not be, I'm not saying you are, but it's one thing to ask yourself, are you trying to write through them? And if you are, go start writing. Doesn't mean you can't still be a producer, but put that, that need, that faucet that's coming through you into your own work so that you have some clarity of there and separation there. And the last thing I'll say is an exercise you can do with him that worked really well for me when I had a sticky, stick, uh, prickly director was... I did that, that exercise and I'll post it on Facebook where you pick your three favorite movies, but not favorite as in like good movies, as in those emotional <laughs> ones that you've watched 500 times. And then ask him to tell them to you. And the emotional cores are gonna be in okay. all three. And yep. then start talking about their movies. Don't talk about him, talk about the movies. It helps his brain have a little space of, to protect his vulnerability that he's talking about the movies he's not talking about himself that can sometimes help bridge you in to what is this about and all of that emotion mm -hmm. stuff yeah. um well i think now we're out of time we now we're out of up. time now uh, we're out of time <laughs> so thanks for tuning in to the screenwriting life on popcorn talk network um of course we're coming back uh next week with a new topic C getting our topics from your gmail so get on the facebook page Get on the Gmail account. Tell us what you want us to talk about. And the Gmail, okay, just so, so you all know, so is um, the screenwriting life at gmail.com. Once again, that's the screenwriting life at gmail.com. <laughs> all right, Thank guys. you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network.